I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are talking with Dr. Mary Moeller about trauma, and we're actually discussing her upcoming presentation at the American Psychiatric Nurses Association Conference that is coming up October 2nd through the 5th in New Orleans. The title of the talk that she is giving, along with Dr. Kate Wheeler, is A Third Nervous System, Lions and Tigers and Bears, Oh My. Dr. Muller, would you be able to explain the polyvagal theory that you discuss in your upcoming presentation? I'm very glad to do so in kind of a little nutshell version. Um, The polyvagal theory was actually developed by Dr. Stephen Porges in the 1990s. He um, is not a clinician. He's a scientist that became very interested in the vagus nerve. And he was researching the vagus nerve and finding that it can speed you up, it can slow you down. And he has a real passion for infants and looking at infant cardiac response to different stimuli. And over the course of his study, he discovered that the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve that exits the um, medulla part of the brainstem, actually has two divisions, a dorsal and a ventral. And the dorsal vagal nerve is um, sort of in, uh, dorsal of course means top, So it's at the top part of the medulla where it exits. And then he discovered a ventral, which is in the front. So if we we think of the medulla kind of looking like a butterfly, you would see the dorsal motor at the top of the right um, wing of the butterfly, and you would see the ventral in the central part of the left wing of the butterfly, if you were thinking of the medulla as that shape. And they exit together out of the medulla. And it's really not one nerve like we think of, but it's sort of like um, the electrical wiring in a house where there's lots and lots of fibers that exit out the same section to go on down the spinal cord and then um, go throughout the body. So the vagus nerve is the largest, the longest. And vagus actually comes from the word um, wandering. And when it was given its Latin name, that's what it was named for, because it wanders all over. And the vagus nerve then separates, this dorsal separates at the diaphragm, and it innervates all of our internal organs below the diaphragm, and the ventral goes to the diaphragm and above. So the dorsal ventral, and I call it DV for short, is very primitive. Um, It was there before the ventral. The ventral actually formed um, as mammals developed. So reptiles all have this dorsal um, uh, vagus. And it's actually the part of the nervous system that allows um, um, reptiles and mammals to play dead, to protect themselves. So it's all about the safety response. But what's interesting about mammals and humans that's different from the reptiles is this um, ventral vagus nerve, which innervates, like I said earlier, above the diaphragm. And that's what enables us to be present, to have eye contact, to be fully engaged with another person. If we are not in our ventral vagus, then people can shut down. And it's actually the physiology behind dissociative responses to extreme stress. So the natural response is to, you know, you pass out, um, play dead. Um, And if you think about uh, mammals, when a, like a rabbit can play dead or a mouse can play dead, so an owl wouldn't swoop down and get it. And um, uh, that's the same thing that happens to humans with dissociation, only they're not physically 
that shut down, but they're emotionally, mentally disconnected. And so all of our work with people who have um, the fight, flight, freeze response, this is the physiology of the freeze response to trauma. So when I'm talking about this with patients, uh, to help them think of it, I'll say, okay, the DV, the dorsal vagal, that sounds like domestic violence. So people who are in different types of traumatic situations, obviously more than just domestic violence, but you can think of it, that's your DV, your domestic violence response, just I, I have to stay alive. Whereas the ventral vagus, if we think, I think of it as very vagus, meaning Las Vegas, which is very socially engaged. <laughs> and it's the, <laughs> it's our very vagus nerve that the ventral that helps us be engaged with one another, fully present, um, eyes, ears, nose, mouth, um, uh, to be present. And in sort of a summary statement of that, it's the um, dorsal, or excuse me, it's the whole polyvagal system that helps us navigate our world in a safe way. That is so fascinating. So I think you pretty much answered what my second question was going to be, which is what are some of the functional differences between the dorsal vagus nerve and the ventral vagus nerve? So just to summarize, would I be correct in stating that the dorsal vagal response has more to do with freezing and the ventral vagal response has more to do with that sort of social connection and uh, taking action in response to a traumatic situation? Is that correct? Absolutely. And there, there's three basic principles that are at the heart of polyvagal theory. And the first one is a term that Dr. Porges um created called neuroception, N-E-U-R-O-C-E-P-T-I-O-N, neuroception. And he coined that as a way to describe what the autonomic nervous system does in response to cues of safety or danger um, or life-threatening um, from within our bodies, in the world around us, uh, and in how we connect to other people. So neuroception is different from perception in which we are consciously engaged in perceiving something. Uh, so in, in perception, we are um, detecting things, but we're very aware about it. Whereas neuroception, this is detection that we are not aware of. So just as, um, and this is the physiology behind what I refer to in trauma work as triggers. Right. So you can have, you know, you can be working with someone that uh, is recovering from, from trauma and they'll tell you, just all of a sudden I just freaked out and I didn't know what was going on. And then we start querying and we'll say, you know, maybe did you hear a song? Did you smell a smell? Um, something that in your environment that you weren't aware of was a warning sign to your brain that there's danger. And oftentimes then patients can say, oh, yeah, you know, there was this scene on this movie and I got really upset, but I, they, they're not aware of it. Okay. It's that dorsal vagal kicks in and people will just numb out. So in our work with patients, we have to help them understand the triggers, which, you know, that takes, um, takes time, but certainly we help people do that. And then to learn to get out of the, the freeze zone, okay, and get into what is referred to as the zone of resilience, where you can get into the ventral vagal and begin to engage. And, and we can do that in a number of ways. You know, you can, uh, through talking with people, um, feeling safe around people, but if persons are in active um, domestic violence situations or other traumatic situations or children that are, you know, um, being beaten and abused, neglected, uh, it's, it's too scary to try to reach out because they don't have a safety factor in their life. 
So that's, that's probably kind of jumping ahead a little bit. But I really wanted to talk about these three principles. So the first one is this neuroception, to know that our brain is wired to pick up danger and it's completely unconscious. It is down at the brain stem level. Then an, another right. feature of um, the organizing principles is hierarchy. And so the hierarchy is that the autonomic nervous system responds to sensations in the body and signals um, from the environment through those three major pathways, okay, through the, um, the vagus, uh, which feeds primarily the parasympathetic nervous system, and then um, the sympathetic nervous system. So when we're looking at um, the dorsal vagal is the most primitive, then came the ventral vagal, then came the sympathetic nervous system. So that works in hierarchy. And when we have patients that are always down in that dorsal vagal, and they're always in that parasympathetic kind of shutdown, it's hard to get them energized, get over to that sympathetic nervous system, which is, you know gives us all of our um, real awareness because that's where our catecholamines and our indolamines are functioning, our dopamine, norepinephrine, um, serotonin, melatonin, epinephrine. Um, so this hierarchy is going on deep inside our brain, and we have to bring this to consciousness. So when we're looking at a, a therapeutic approach to people, it's how do we raise that fear response out of the gut? Um, and I'll digress here for a second. You can think about when, when you were young and your mother hollered at you and she used that tone in her voice when she called your name and you get that pit in your stomach. <laughs> okay, that pit, that's your dorsal vagal. It's preparing you like, oh boy, something bad's going to happen. Yet you've, you're still in your ventral vagal because you're thinking, well, now what did I do wrong? You know, oh my gosh, am I in trouble? And you're, you, you know, you're not totally shut down. If you were raised in an environment where you couldn't ask the questions, or you couldn't even negotiate, you know, with your mom or your dad, you wouldn't get up into that ventral vagal. And so these are our children that are living in such tremendous fear. So we have to get it from that parasympathetic side over to that sympathetic side right. where we can you know, help people really then get in touch with their heartbeat and their breathing and the kinds of um, safe um, interactions and people that they can be with. And then the third part is the third principle that Porges identifies is co-regulation. And this co-regulation is, um, as Porges says, a biological imperative. And it's, it's a need that, that must be met to sustain life. So it's this reciprocal regulation of our autonomic nervous system states that help us feel safe, and that we can then get into connection with other people and enter into a trusting relationship. So those three principles, neuroception, hierarchy, and co-regulation are the principles behind polyvagal theory. Wow, that was such great information. Thank you for sharing that with us. How would you say that these differences manifest in behavioral responses to fear, danger, and safety. I think you just sort of touched on that. Um, but if you could maybe just give a few more examples about how um, those the two differences of the vagus nerves manifest in um, behavioral responses. Sure. So um, that's a great question. So when we perceive danger... When we become into a neuroceptive state and your, um, you know, your nervous system has, has perceived there's danger, the dorsal vagal goes on warp speed and it's going to act to shut down below the diaphragm. And this is when you start seeing people go into panic states. And... You know, people manifest panic in different ways. Some people will just dissociate away if they learn to dissociate um, when traumas occurred. Others will 
just to be frantic and they'll be, they'll be having um, all sorts of somatic complaints. They'll have problems in the GI tract. They'll have problems with low back pain. Um, they'll have dysregulation with cardiac and pulmonary functioning. Um, you'll see people will have um, bradycardia. This is when people go into um, the shock phase and they can become very bradycardic. Their heart rates can run 30, 40 you know, beats per minute, um, their respirations can slow down. So when we see um, the phrase die from fright, that's the dorsal vagal at its prime function. So when we are hearing from patients how they respond to fear, then we can start to use right. this now as our anchor going, oh, my gosh. OK, so they were raised in this really pretty horrific environment and their dorsal vagal is primed. So what we have to do is get them out of that dorsal vagal below the diaphragm and focus on above the diaphragm. So the first thing that we can do is get people to breathe. And we have to teach them how to take their pulse and how to breathe abdominal breathing, um, which a lot of people, it's very hard for people that are in the dorsal vagal response because <laughs> they're panting. You know, they're just, uh, just panting. And to try to get that respiratory rate down and get them fully oxygenating their lungs so we can enervate the the ventral vagal. So it begins with breathing. And so when you think about um, all these various wonderful different therapeutic modalities that help people with anxiety, all of them have something to do with breathing. And so it's teaching, you know, abdominal breathing, you know, effective breathing. And a lot of people say, well, you know, all you want to do is get me to breathe. Well, we knew that breathing helped, but we didn't really know until Porges theory why breathing helped. And, and yeah, and then as an advanced practice nurse, um, working with patients who have been um, who are recovering from trauma, if we can explain to them that their body is doing exactly what their body is supposed to be doing, their brain is doing what their brain is supposed to be doing, that they are not failures, that there's not something that is faulty in them, but the one part of their system is real overdeveloped. And so our work has to, to be to get them from the diaphragm up. And so getting them breathing, getting them calmed down and staying with eye contact, it's, it's all about social engagement. It's all about feeling safe around other people, being around people that love you and respect you. Uh, and have no expectations. That somebody that you can just be with will help this whole social engagement system develop. We know there's a number of fabulous therapies out there. And a lot of times, you know, they've gotten uh, kind of poo-poo. People say, oh, those are fluff, you know, uh, anything, electrical balancing and all these things. Well, no, they are not fluff by any way, shape, or form, what they're doing is getting us into the ventral vagal, which then allows the sympathetic to function normally, and we can get breathing and heart rate, and they can get better cognitive function because we've got to get up into that frontal lobe, and we've got to get um, dopamine functioning, and we've got to help people be able to use their intelligence. But you can't get over to that if you're just stuck in the, you know, in, in the, the dorsal vagal. So it's, you know, it really has given us, myself in particular, just like, whoa, this major aha when I started learning about this. And it was like, wow, oh, this explains everything. So when you look at massage therapy, for instance, okay, it, it's, it's all about trying to connect, get your whole body connected. And what that's doing is doing all, it's hooking together the entire hierarchy. 
calming down the dorsal vagal, activating the ventral, getting into your sympathetic, so then you can really um, get those two sides balanced. Right. I, I've i heard of, you know, stories where people have gone through something like massage therapy and that will activate something inside of them and they'll s- suddenly start to maybe even open up about a trauma or something um, or be more emotional than they would have been prior to that therapy. So it's amazing to know kind of the theory or the explanation behind um, perhaps that response. Oh my goodness. Yes. You know, the massage therapists are trained that, you know, if this person has been a victim of violence and they've never talked about it or it's been repressed and you touch a part of their body that, you know, was severely wounded, um, uh, kids have been beaten up and they'll carry, you know, Bessel, Bessel van der Kolk's fabulous book, The Body Keeps the Score, where where traumas happen in the body, they're, they're logged in there until they're brought to consciousness, which is getting to the sympathetic nervous system. And massage therapists are often the first time that will, will be a trigger. Um, I, I can tell you a really interesting story. A um, long time ago, I had a patient who um, discussed when she dissociated and really first time and had just a, a horrific, horrific experience, ended up on an inpatient psychiatric unit. Um, she had um, was very excited. She was young. I mean, she was in her 20s. She'd gotten married and, and was madly in love with her husband. And they were able to buy their first house. And he was so excited to mow their lawn, their own lawn. And and he was went out and mowed the lawn. And he came back in and it was kind of sweaty and smelled like the yard. And he just gives, gives her this big hug. And he was so proud of mowing his lawn the first time. And she absolutely went into this panic state, started screaming and kicking and hitting and, and you know, went to, and hid, you know, in a closet. And he, he didn't know what was going on. And so he calls wow. 911. They, they haul her into, you know, um, an emergency room and she gets admitted to an inpatient psychiatric unit. And she had a social worker assigned to her that was the one that uncovered what had gone on and really helped change the course of this girl's life. And what had happened was when she was 11, she had been raped in a park where the grass had just been mowed. And so she was in this, you know, wet, newly mowed grass when she was raped and she panicked and she dissociated as so many young people do and never told a person completely dissociated it off of her conscious awareness and her husband coming in, smelling like grass, putting his Um. arms around her, giving her a kiss is what triggered that whole thing. And her dorsal vagus went wild. I mean, the entire neuroception was activated and she was, she, she was completely, um, basically almost borderline psychotic. But thank you. She had that social worker that helped her process that through. Of course, this is long before, you know, Porges told us all about the polyvagal. So, but I use that because it's a very classic example of, this response of neuroception. Right. And and that actually leads me to my next question, which was, could you explain what happens in dissociation after a trauma? Well, in, again, kind of a nutshell version, the way I like to explain it to patients is that the body is present, but the mind is not. So there's a trauma theory in dissociation called T minus one, which is trauma minus one second. And when um, a young person in particular, if you've grown up with trauma in your life, learn that, oh, I'm going to get beat up or my dad is going to beat up my mom. And they basically go unco- they go unconscious, but they're awake. So their brain completely shuts down all awareness. And children will often tell you that, uh, when they're dissociated, they go up in the, the up on the ceiling, and they're in a ce- uh, up on the ceiling looking down, and they can see somebody being beaten or hurt, but they have no awareness that it's them themselves. And so, dissociation, I believe, is is a God given gift 
as a way to tolerate something completely intolerable and survive it. And uh, in a dissociative state, you have no conscious functioning of awareness. You're completely shut down. And the dorsal vagal is what's controlling you. It's making the human play dead, but not be dead. Not like a mammal that looks like they're dead. So what will happen is um, kind of back to dissociation is that once the trauma is passed and their body is no longer being hurt, they will eventually just reconnect and the uh, ventral, or excuse me, the ventral vagus sort of comes online and the sympathetic comes online a little bit. So this individual um, can go through the motions, but um, uh, they may be engaged, but they may not be. So you, you, when you see people who function in a dissociative state, um, as we know, many people can, they can go out and go shopping, um, they can meet people and not have any consciousness of that. They can literally go through the motions of life, but have no conscious awareness of it. And it, it's not uncommon for people who've been in dissociative states to have other people come up to them and say, oh, I met you at such and such a place. And they'll actually say, no, I, I've never met you in my life. That, that's the power of this. Right. Wow. Could you explain a little bit about the chemistry of fear? Could you explain a little bit about the chemistry of fear? Sure. The chemistry of fear involves uh, basically two systems. It involves the um, uh, locus ceruleus, which gives us norepinephrine, which uh, is connected to the adrenal gland to release epinephrine. Uh, and then uh, we have the hormonal system that comes out of the hypothalamus, that releases cortisol releasing factor, which tells the pituitary to release adrenal cortical tropical hormone, which tells the adrenal gland to release cortisol. So the chemistry of fear involves a hormonal regulation of cortisol. And for those who might not know what cortisol is, it's our natural cortisone. So it's an anti-inflammatory. And people often wonder, well, why does the brain make an anti-inflammatory? Well, it's doing that for self-protection because when there is fear, there's a lot of hyper firing in the brain. There's a lot of extra hyper electrical functioning and the, the epinephrine system is going and it's, it's, um, it's irritating to the brain. So we have a natural um, production of an anti-inflammatory, our own cortisol. It's very brilliant. And there is a system in the brain called uh, negative feedback loop that once the cortisol is circulating, the brain would pick it up. Um, that, okay, we've got cortisol on board, we can stop producing that. Uh, we've got adrenaline on board, okay, the stress is passed, we can stop producing it. But in our patients that have chronic fear, and they're chronically activated, and their vagus nerve is chronically activated, the negative feedback loops don't work properly, and people continue to produce cortisol, and it has a whole series of negative consequences. Um, it can affect metabolism, it causes weight gain, it can cause actual belly fat to accumulate, um, it affects, it, it, it can affect, um, seriously affect blood sugar regulation and eventually even our own immune regulation. So people that have high levels of cortisol being produced often have a lot of autoimmune disorders as a consequence. So when that, uh, the natural feedback loops don't work anymore, and people are chronically stressed, chronically afraid, then we start seeing body system breakdown. We see people that can go from headaches to migraines. We can see, we can people go from um, just some blood sugar dysregulation all the way to diabetes. And we're seeing um, the linking now through multiple traumas, um, multiple states of fear. Um, you may be familiar with the ACEs study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences mm -hmm. Scale. Well, we know that mm -hmm. that work was done in primary care that people with all of these complicating physical illnesses, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, hypothyroidism, etc., um, what they had in common was trauma. 
So we know if there's um, more than four sources of um, childhood traumatic events that this individual is probably going to be in primary care much more than the person that didn't have tra trauma in the background with chronic illnesses. So getting the chemistry shut down uh, is something that also goes along with um, polyvagal, helping people to feel safe, feel connected, feel socially engaged, feel accepted, be in a trusting um, environment. What is the survival circuit view of fear and defensive motivation? Okay, so this um, survival circuit view of fear uh, and motivation to defend ourselves was developed by Joseph Ledoux, who's a very famous researcher at NYU who's been studying anxiety for his whole life. And he has come up with a really nice uh, model in his 2015 book called Anxious of what happens when we have a threat stimulus. So the brain Okay, so our neuroception kicks in, there's a threat stimulus. And the amygdala then kicks in def these defensive survival circuits. And we have the threat detection system in the brain that then kicks in the defense response control. And that's what goes directly to the dorsal vagal. And we can get into freezing. So if we can help people understand that this defense survival circuit, it's good, it's healthy, but if you're always in that, you're not gonna be able to get your cognitive systems working. And so uh, Ledoux described what he called the defense motivational state where people can get into avoiding and defending themselves that way as opposed, as opposed to defending themselves by freezing. So by getting out of the dorsal vagal in the freezing state, we can get up to the avoidance state. And then that is what can help us actually get into the sympathetic nervous system mm -hmm. and get into our cognitive systems and get into um, memory and attention and decision making and figuring out how, how am I going to get this under control. And the other aspect of that is that, that brings it to actual consciousness. So these avoidance and freezing states that Ledoux describes, they're, they're pretty unconscious. That, that parasympathetic is, is pretty unconscious. So by raising it up, we're going, oh my gosh, my body's doing this. I did that. Um, I need to know how to, to function better. It then helps us get into the consciousness. So it's all about being motivated to defend ourselves from a cognitive perspective as opposed to just a vagus nerves perspective. Right. And it's that seems so empowering. It's really an amazing, uh, amazing theory. And I think it's helping a lot of people. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Yes. So if I can refer um, the listeners to Stephen Porges, anything that he's written, um, but he's got a couple of great books. He's got one called The Clinical Applications of the Polyvagal Theory. And he has another one called The Pocket Guide to the Polyvagal Theory. And the, um, the subtitle on that is The Transformative Power of Feeling Safe. And then he's worked closely with a therapist. Her name is Deb Dana. And she is amazing. So she co-wrote, um, well, she basically was the primary author for a new book called The Polyvagal Theory in Therapy. And Dr. Porges has written the foreword, but it's all about how she has developed interventions um, specific for therapists to use to help people um, with their patients and their clients to be able to do different exercises and train their brain to uh, basically co-regulate between the two pieces of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So her book is just wonderful. And her, her byline of the book entitled The Polyvagal Theory in Therapy is engaging the rhythm of regulation. So instead of having people be dysregulated, using polyvagal theory principles helps people become 
regulated. And it's very hopeful. And it's, it's very, you know, very empowering. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dr. Moeller. And, and those links to those books that you mentioned will be listed in the podcast show notes. So feel free to check that out. Thank you so much for being a part of this episode. You're absolutely welcome. And thank you for asking me. And uh, I hope that the listeners find this helpful. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in to this episode of the NEI podcast. This podcast was brought to you by NEI Membership. You're busy caring for your patients, and you might not have time to keep up with the ever-changing treatments in mental health care. You don't have to. NEI membership includes regular psychiatric news updates, CME activities on the hottest topics, and the most cutting-edge prescribing app available today. To learn more, visit the link provided in the podcast description.